coming. We really are grateful with the response that we had from the community all around the world on this topic. And uh, have to also thank our funding sources. So we have money from the University of Michigan and money from the Institute for Complex Adaptive Matter. Uh, someplace I have a slide changer here. I can persuade it to work. <laughs> Nowadays, it's hard to get money for things, and so we're particularly grateful for our, our funding sources. I have some other important matters, and, and the first one is to thank Hao Chang and the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Physics of Solids in Dresden for strong encouragement uh, in all of this, and also for in, in, informal financial support uh, in that it essentially paid for all of his people to come, and that left us with some extra travel funds to help bring students and, and postdocs here. And I, that it just helped, really helped balance the budget, and we're grateful to Howe for, for making that contribution. And actually, I think the original idea to have a conference here really came from Howe saying, you know, you guys ought to have a conference. And I thought, geez, that's a good idea. And so we pursued it really because of Howe, and we're grateful to him for all of that early input and his support to us as we've gone along here. So ICAM policy is to have lots of time for discussion and I think it's just basically a good policy and something we would have liked to do anyway. Uh, so we have 15 minutes of discussion following the talks uh, and so there's plenty of time actually to ask for questions. So I'd ask the, the chairs for the, of the sessions to try to keep the, the conference on time so that we actually will have that time for discussion. I mean, it's always tempting to the speakers, of course, to say, I have 15 minutes for discussion, so I really can have a longer talk. Um, and I understand that temptation. I know it well. Uh, but it's very nice also to have time for people to really ask questions and interact and engage. Uh, and I think in particularly a, a topic like this, where there's a lot to discuss and a fairly focused agenda, um, it's particularly important to have time to interact and discuss and ask questions. I should also say that we've just finished two days of tutorial sessions for graduate students and postdocs, and so they're all primed up uh, and should, in principle, be ready to uh, ask interesting questions, and we've encouraged them to just do that. Um, so anyway, the discussion's important. Uh, we also have three open discussion sections which will be led uh, and so the, the concept here is that there's time for topics arising. So if, if something comes along and you think, gosh, you know, I have, I have five minutes of, of things I could present or a couple of slides that I could make to make a point that, I, that didn't really get said properly, um, tell us and we will simply insert it in one of the discussion sections and the discussion section leaders, the discussion session leaders will accommodate that. Um, there is also a sort of a planned topic, and the discussion session leaders will have things to say to try to help lead us along in order to have focused discussions. And if you look at the program, we've listed what those, those topics are. These discussion sections come a little bit later after we've had time to get some material you know, out in the open and on the, on the table for people to, to uh, digest, uh, but uh, I think Many of the issues that we want to discuss will, will be accommodated in the general category of, the, of these topics. And then 15 minutes on Friday, we'll, we'll spend discussing gateways to emergence. As you may know, uh, ICAM, uh, the Institute for Complex Adaptive Matter, uh, has as its uh, overarching theme that of emergence. Um, and it's interested in emergence in, in all kinds of phenomena. Um, ranging from the microscopic quantum mechanical world all the way to biological systems. And so, again, part of what, what we do to get ICAM funding is to pay some attention to the way in which emergence comes about in our particular, uh, in our particular topic. And so we'll, we'll just spend a few minutes maybe getting some ideas from people about now what, it, what are the, the overarching themes that are, have a cooperative character for, for our particular uh, uh, subtopic that we're talking about here? And then uh, it's also ICAM policy to videotape the talks, but we wouldn't make any public distribution without consent. And in fact, if, if you just tell us I prefer not to be taped, we won't do it. 
So, you know, you can think about that. Uh, but in any case, uh, we won't make any public distribution without consulting you first. And, and as I say, we won't, we won't take you uh, if you just say, I prefer that you don't do that. And then finally, some issues that we might try to clarify as we go along. And I have to say that when I was making my list, it was alarming to me how easy it was to make a list this long. Uh, so there's a lot of meat on the table uh, in this context. So I'll just, I'll just run down. So we actually have some cases of differing transport results where we would have thought that the samples are not only the same and the groups know what they're doing and nonetheless, similar measurements haven't yielded necessarily the, don't get always the same answers. We have differing spectroscopy results. I think an interesting question is whether robustness of the surface states and transport is a good argument for topological protection. I have to say that my prejudice going in was from what, I mean, I'm not really a surface state person, and I've done photoemission all my life for a large fraction of what I have done. And I wasn't deliberately interested in surface states, I was always interested in bulk. But the sense that I had over the years was that if you if you oxidize the surface or do something to it, the surface state will go away. And certainly one of the one of the tests that we have in photoemission for a surface state is we put a little gas in the chamber and it doesn't take much, and the surface states are usually affected by that. However, I have to say that recently I have learned that there are one or two famous semiconductor surfaces that you can oxidize in quantum well states to survive. Uh, and I have and we have some evidence from Jonathan Denlinger that some quantum well kinds of states on the surface of EUV6 seem to be pretty robust. So I, I, I'm a little less strong with this sense, but still in all, I have this gut feeling that if you take a rare earth material, it's so reactive, uh, and, and, and it's just amazing to me that the transport can be done on oxidized surfaces, these materials, and I still have the feeling there should be something very special about them, and one possibility, of course, is the topological protection. We have some inconsistencies between transport and spectroscopies. So for example, in the Hospin Alpha and the Arc test, we would really like it if those guys got the same Fermi surfaces, and we would like it if we could take that information and use it to understand transport, and, and we just can't make the, that kind of a, of, a, of a picture. We can't close this loop. I think the origin of the bulk gap is still interesting. You know, here we have a phenomena whose who's Prediction depends on properties of the bulk gap, and so uh, you, you should be able to understand the bulk gap uh, really well, I would think, and particularly in this context. I think the general sense from the topology community, I think, is who cares as long as the symmetry is right, uh, and maybe that's a reasonable way to look at it, but I, I'm hoping that before this topic dies down again, we will sort out some of these kinds of issues about bulk uh, mixed valence. Uh, what the surface conductivity, so we actually find that, that uh, oh, I'm not sure this is a well-written question here, but the, the sense of this is that if you look at data in which one has done something to the, to the bulk uh, and it caused the bulk transport to vary, it turns out that the surface uh, conductivity seems to ride up and down on the bulk background. Uh, and if you think about the surface states as just being um, existing, well protected, and, and isolated, then you, you wouldn't you wouldn't find this this kind of behavior where somehow the surface conductivity seems to ride up and down. And I think we'll actually hear some arguments from in, in a talk or two that this is evidence for uh, some component of bulk transport in the material for this low uh, low temperature plateau. So I think there, there's, again, some issues about the bulk transport not sorted out. So in all of this, you wonder if, if you really understand what the surface is doing yet. And of course, there's always the question of whether or not the samples are really all equivalent. If you make them different ways, uh, does that uh, actually affect some of the transport? Uh, again, I had a prejudice going in that because we were dealing with some kind of protected surface phenomena, that wouldn't be so important, but, but that's probably not, not yet right. Uh, so, you know, those, I was talking to Gil Landerich a, a few days ago, and, and he's, his primary statement was, we don't have the samples under control yet. 
Uh, so, you know, if Gil tells you something, you probably should take that seriously. Um, I think we might want to know, is there anything really intrinsically different about a strongly correlated TI system? We have made the point for SMV6 that the bulk uh, conductivity is, is really truly gets small as you lower the temperature, and so that's a very practical, really important thing about this material. Uh, but it's not n necessarily intrinsic to a, a strongly correlated system unless we could understand that there is some protection against impurities in a strongly correlated system, and there might be some way to make arguments like that. Uh, for example, if you had a condo kind of phenomenon, uh, then you could argue that uh, changes in stoichiometry still keep the action pinned at the chemical potential, and, and so there's, there's a way to maybe understand that a, uh, a strongly correlated system could be more resistant to uh, topologic, I'm sorry, to stoichiometric changes. Uh, and then finally, where are all the new materials that we imagined would just blossom out of nowhere that we need to grow a subfield out of SMB6? If this is not to be a one, you know, a, a one horse, a one pony show uh, where we just study SMB6 for a while, but, but it, if it's to evolve into some new field, we need to have more materials. And so I think that that's another important uh, kind of issue that we need to think about. Okay, so I'm done, and we'll transition now uh, to the first session. Uh, we'll hook up a computer, and uh, Pedro Schlotman has uh, agreed to chair, chair this for us.